Well, I brought a smaller Bible this week. <laughs> well, last week we started a three part sermon on the Word of God. And last week I brought a sermon entitled, What Does God Want for His Word in Our Lives? And we brought that one. And I want to read to you our text this morning, Psalms chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. You want to turn there? Psalms chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. I've got a note for you to make in the margin of your Bible. Down by Psalms chapter 7, write Psalms 11, 3. I'm going to read Psalms 11.3 to you first. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Psalms chapter 12, verse 6. For the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Amen. Well, last session we established what God wants us from His Word to hear His Word, to accept His Word, and to believe His Word or to act on His Word. You act on what you believe in. And we brought out how a person's name is important to him. You know, and we brought out how contracts were settled by a, by a good name and a handshake years ago and not too far long ago. We brought out how if, if you call someone a liar, it was grounds for a duel in this country. And, and Vice President Burr and Alexander Hamilton had a duel and Burr killed Hamilton. And, uh, you know, a, a person's name is important and God's name is important. We're not supposed to take it in vain. But God has taken His Word and exalted it above his name. That's pretty incredible when you think about it. Um, so, we, we talked about that last week. And we, we talked about how God promised to protect and preserve his word so we could do that. Then we talked about those who, who take that verse and they say, well, God only protects and preserves his word in the originals. Well, we don't have the originals. Nobody knows where the originals are. And we talked about that last week. And I, I, I wanted to add a caveat. When I talked about last week, those who, who believe that only the originals can, are preserved, uh, the caveat to that thought, I believe that God did and currently is protecting and keeping His Word to us in the original manuscripts. I believe that. However, since God wants us to hear and accept and believe His Word from this generation and forever, I believe we must have God's Word in a form that we can hold in our hands, that we can open, that we can read, and know what God wants from us on a daily basis. That's called the Bible. The Word of God is the foundation for all true doctrinal beliefs. If you don't believe God can preserve His Word to us, and if you believe God's Word is only preserved in the originals, then you can't access it. We don't know where the originals are. If you believe that, you have no doctrinal foundation. That's why I had you write that verse, chapter 11, next, next to chapter 12 and verse 7. And if you don't have a foundation, you can't say, thus saith the Lord. And you can't prove that God actually said what you are preaching. Because you don't have access to God's Word since you believe it's only in the originals and we don't know where the originals are. 
you have no authority. So with that caveat, last week we spoke to the multiple versions of the Bible, and I prodded you to point to the one that you want to accept as God's preserved Word. I mean, do you want the King James Bible, the KJV? You want the Revised Version? Do you want the Revised Standard Version? The ASV, the ISV, the NKVD? The NIV, or do you want the Amplified Bible, the New English Bible, the Phillips New Testament, the Good News Bible? Which one? Which one do you want? There's over 60 of them. Which one do you think it is? Or do you think it's all of them? Confused? I want to remind you that God is not the author of confusion. And I was going over this and thinking about it. My wife and I were buying our first house back, I think we bought our first house in 1970, wasn't it, honey? And the, the thing with uh, integrating white neighborhoods was really taking off heavy in the United States at that time. And they, they were trying to move blacks into white neighborhoods. And there was a thing in real estate that they called steering the buy. And so we made pretty good friends with our real estate agent, and I asked her, I said, how do you steer someone into a house? And she said, well, really, it's very easy. I said, oh? <laughs> she said, well, if, if you were looking for a house, I would take you and your wife out and show her, show, show you two, maybe three homes, and that's all I would show you, and you could make your decision between those three homes out of the parameters that, that you give us, I, I would select the homes for, to take you to. That's what's showing on TV right now and all those home channels, you know, they, they show three homes. And uh, she said, but if, and I said, well, how would you steer a black in, into a house? And she said, I would take, take their families out and show them nine, 10, 12 homes. By the time it's all over, they are so confused, I put them wherever I want them. Oh, wow. Now that's not racist. No, but that's an example of confusion. And God is not the author of confusion. We've got all these Bibles out there. It is confusing. Who do you think is the author of that? So, basically we have two lines of thinking in this preservation issue. We have those who believe God preserved His Word indeed, as He promised. And then we have those who believe that God did not preserve His Word, only in the originals. So, as I was thinking about this, I believe that an examination of the text that the Bible was translated from is key to answering this question we've, we've tried to bring up this morning as to which version of the Bible we can accept as the true Word of God. Now, I want to say to you this morning, I'm not a Greek linguist. I'm not a Hebrew linguist. I'm not anywhere close. I took Greek in, high, in college and Bible school, and it showed me enough to, to make me realize if I want to know something about Greek, I better get a lexicon down off the bookshelf and see what that word means. Because <laughs> I'm not going to dissect it myself. So. As I try and take this through, through I, I have worked all week on this. It's probably not going to show very good. But I'm telling you, this is a deep subject. You, 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 you can get in over your head so fast. I, I'm trying to take the top off, the, off of this and give it to you so you can understand. I'm trying to whet your appetite. I'm trying to show you something that maybe you've never seen before. So. If you believe that God did preserve His Word to us, you probably believe that the Levites and the scribes faithfully copied the original documents, and that God kept His promise by protecting them from copying errors in, into those documents. 
And you believe that God may have managed to keep His pure word to mankind preserved and protected through the scribes and the Pharisees in their diligence in copying the documents. You believe a comparison, then, of ancient text will validate your belief in that the majority of the ancient texts will agree with each other because of the diligence of the scribes and Pharisees in copying them. <clears throat> you also believe that in, in agreement they will be in doctrine, but also in things like spelling, punctuation, and grammar. So that's exactly what the received text is, or what we call the majority text, or the authorized text. <laughs> They're all the same thing. Um, there's over 5,000 documents. Some claim there's as many as 5,600. Some claim there's as many as 5,300. This is the kind of thing you get into when you start digging into this. You know, you, 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 your head hurts by the time you get done with it. But out of those 5,000 documents, they are in agreement with each other 99 to 97% of the time. That's a pretty, pretty good number. So to be fair uh, about this, there's disagreement as to whether not or not the majority text, which I've just described as over 5,000 manuscripts, was used for the King James Bible or the Texas Receptus, which is, which is uh, closely associated with the majority text. One guy says it's the Texas Receptus, the other guy says it's a majority text. I'm, I'm, I'm going with the majority text here for, for learning purposes. These kinds of professional disagreements are constant throughout the study of the text and the translations used in putting the Bible together. These disagreements stem basically, I think, from the underlying belief of the Greek or Hebrew scholar as to whether or not God could and did preserve His Word. You know, what you believe under, underneath everything else pushes what you believe about the Bible. If you believe God did not protect His Word, you may feel it was impossible for God to keep His promise because of the human element. You may feel as people copied the manuscripts, mistakes crept in. Then the next scribe to copy those mistakes added a few of his own. Before long, we had a very inaccurate manuscript, leaving us with little knowledge of what the originals actually said. If you do not believe God protected His Word, you may believe a search of the oldest manuscripts would solve this problem, as they would most likely be comparatively free of error. And this is called the older is better doctrine. Because they, being older, it would mean they're closer to the original documents and have not been copied as many times. So that's exactly what happened. Two ancient doctrine uh, manuscripts were found in Alexandria, Egypt, at the base of Mount Sinai. Now here again, some say it's two documents, some say it's four. I think it was originally two, and it grew to four as, as, as things moved along through, through, through the history of, of, of the text. When they were discovered, they caused a great excitement in the ranks of linguist Bible scholars. These manuscripts were seen as older than many of the majority text manuscripts. Therefore, they were thought to be Better, older is better, and to be closer to the originals because of that. These manuscripts have been labeled the minority text and are in great disagreement with the majority text. <clears throat> so we have 5,000 manuscripts that are in 99% agreement with each other, and we have the minority text, which are two manuscripts which don't agree with the majority text, and they don't even agree with each other. But because they are older, many linguists consider them to be superior. 
Bible manuscripts can be tracked back to their origins and have been tracked back to their origins, and there's only two sources for them, Antioch and Alexandria. The majority text and the minority text, the majority was originated in Antioch, Syria, and the minority text originated in Alexandria, Egypt. Now, what we're considering right now really is very important. Because where a manuscript is found becomes subtly important. The majority text is associated with the Church of Antioch. The Church of Antioch is the first place where saints were called Christians. In Acts 13, Paul and Barnabas were sent out by the Church of Antioch and by the Holy Ghost in Acts 13.2. In Acts 13, 47 and 49, it are key verses. They say, For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light unto the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. I thought that was a strange choice of words in our scriptures, don't you? Don't you think it's interesting? The word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. However, when you study the ministry of the Apostle Paul and his journeys, you will see that he never, ever never went to Egypt. I believe this is key in identifying which set of texts are the Word of God. This information be, should be useful, the fact that Paul never went to Egypt, in answering the question, where was the Word of the Lord published? In Antioch or in Alexandria? So then we have what we call, what we've been talking about the majority text, and it's 5,000 manuscripts that agree 99% with each other. Then we have the minority text that were found in Egypt. Now, Egypt is a place that has long been known to be a biblical symbol of the world against God and His people and against God's Word. So these minority texts were found at an old monastery on, Mount, on, the, on the base of Mount Sinai in a kindling basket sitting next to a stove by a guy named Tischendorf. I'm going to quote 1611kingjames.com here, and it's, this quote is, in the year of 1844, whilst traveling under the patronage of Frederick Augustus, King of Saxony, in quest of manuscripts, Tischendorf reached the covenant of St. Catherine on Mount Sinai. Here, observing some old-looking documents in a basket full of papers ready for lighting the stove, he picked them out and discovered that there were 43 vellum leaves of the Septuagint version. Some enemies of the defense of the King James Bible have claimed that the manuscripts were not found in a wastebasket, but they were. That's exactly how Tischendorf described it. He said, I perceived a large and wide basket full of old parchments, and the librarian told me that two heaps like this had already been committed to the flames. What a surprise! And this comes out of the narrative of the discovery of the Sciatic Manuscripts, page 23. Then there's a name, man named John Burgeon, who was alive when Tischendorf discovered the Codex Sinaiticus, and also personally visited St. Catharines to research ancient manuscripts. And he testified that the manuscripts got deposited in the waste paper basket of the covenant. That's from the Revisionist Revised, 1883, page 319 and 342. And there's more. Burgeon said, It certainly appears that the Orthodox monks had long since decided 
that the numerous omissions and alterations in the manuscript had rendered it useless and had stored it away in some closet where it remained unused for centuries. Yet Tissendorf, the person who claims to have found them, promoted them widely and vigorously as representing a more accurate text than the thousands of manuscripts supported by the Texas Receptus. Furthermore, he assumed that it came from about the fourth century, but he never found any actual proof that it dated earlier than the 12th century. Dr. F. H. A. Shriver, who published a full coalition of the Codex Synacteus, what we know today as the minority text, in 1864 testified, the Codex is covered with alterations of an obvious correctional character, brought in by at least 10 different revisers, some of them systematically spread over every page, others occasional or are limited to separate portions of the manuscripts, and many of these being contemporaneous with the first writer, but for the greater part belonging to the 6th or 7th century. Thus it is evident that scribes of bygone centuries did not consider Synacticus to represent a pure text. And why it should be so revered by modern textual critics is a mystery. It's from Codex Synacteus, 1611, KingJamesBible.com. Now these manuscripts that we're talking about here find their place in what is called the minority text, and there is great disagreement with the majority text and often disagreement amongst themselves, these two documents. And now this is important to note. The, the, what I'm getting into now is accenting your faith in the majority in text. The minority text has since grown to include 47 documents, which would include the Vaticanus text, the Vatican text, the Catholic Bible text, which Rome claims to be the oldest. So this philosophy of oldest is best seems to have taken a dominant position with modern day translators. These ancient manuscripts of the minority texts are what our newer Bible versions have been translated from. And where there is disagreement, a Greek scholar named Westcott and Hort, scholars like Westcott and Hort, two men, would decide which word would be the most correct. Now these two men, Westcott and Hort, were known to be highly skilled linguists. They produced a Greek New Testament in 1881 based on the founding findings of Tischendorf. They produced a Greek New Testament on this minority text from the minority text that they found. And they, they grew to have great influence over the translation of what we call the newer versions of Scripture. <clears throat> so, if you're considering a newer translation, you would be wise to research these two men, Westcott and Hort. They were both older is better proponents. Westcott did not accept the account of Genesis 1 through 3. Westcott did not believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ. Westcott did not believe in the literal second coming of Christ and said that he was partial to the Church of Rome. Hort was a Darwinist. He favored evolutionary theory. He did not accept the infallibility of scriptures, and he believed that Father God was creator instead of Jesus Christ. Both men were involved, involved in the occult, and even founded several occult societies, two of which were named the Hermes Club and the Ghostly Guide. Ghostly Guild, I'm sorry. Are you shaking your head yet? This is funny. 
Which text would you say is the most accurate to the original? The minority text from Alexandria, Egypt? A symbol of the world, the two ancient manuscripts that do not even agree with themselves? Or the majority text out of Antioch, where Christians were first called Christians, and the 5,000 manuscripts that are in 99% agreement with each other. Now, while you're thinking about this, I, I, if, if, you were like, if you're like me right now, you're overwhelmed and you're saying, you're saying, that guy's full of it. I want you to go look it up. Amen. I want you to go to your internet and look it up. I'm not lying to you for what I found. Let me remind you that Paul said that even in his day, while he was alive, that many corrupted the Word of God. He said that in 2 Corinthians 2.17. Would you consider a text written while Paul was still alive to be an ancient text? I think so. The Apostle Paul even warned the Galatians, the Church of Galatia, to be on the alert for those who would come to them and pervert the gospel of Christ in Galatians 1.7. 2 Thessalonians 2.2, Paul says, acknowledges that people were writing false letters in his name to the churches in Asia. So when we read the epistles of Paul in our Bibles, we are reading legitimate letters that were given to him by the Holy Spirit to the early churches and were later canonized in the Scripture. But the question is, I'm bringing this up because... Do you think it is possible for an archaeologist one day to find some of these false letters that were written in Paul's name to the churches in Asia and call them ancient manuscripts and think that they would be valid? Because there would be older than the majority text, these so-called scholars would feel they're closer to the originals and therefore more correct. 1 Corinthians 3.19 says, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. So I'm bringing it this to show you that obviously older does not equate to more accurate. Or does it mean they're closer to the originals? Now what we're really talking about here is inspiration and preservation. I'm going to quote Dr. Samuel Gipp, G-I-P-P, -P, he's a doctor of divinity. Inspiration is when God takes a blank sheet of paper and uses men to write His Word. Preservation is when God takes those words already written and uses men to preserve them for today. Both of these actions are divine and are assured by God as recorded in Psalms 12, 6, and 7. The original autographs were inspired. Now I told you last week that there are men in our movement in the grace movement, who don't believe God can preserve His Word to us today. They only believe that God preserved His Word in the originals. That means they don't have a copy of God's Word in their hand. According to their own belief system, if they don't have the originals, they don't have God's Word in their hand. Because if God's Word is only inspired in the originals, according to them, and we don't know where they're at. Now, what is it in the heart of man that causes them to argue for inspiration and then turn right around and argue against preservation? What logic is it that says God can use sinful men to pen His inspired Word but cannot use sinful men to preserve His Word? And isn't it convenient to believe only the originals are inspired, only the originals are preserved Word of God, 
they've been lost. Because if that's truth, then you have no foundation. You have no authority. You cannot say, thus saith the Lord. And all you have in your hand is the word of men. Wow. So I ask you again. In America, in English, where is God's word? If you want to know what God says, where are you going to go to? Now, the King James Bible has been the most popular Bible for over 400 years. I think it just recently got knocked out of first place saddle by the NIV. In the latter years, there has been a plethora of translations hit the market. Those who count such things say it's around 60 versions of the Bible besides the King James Version. So that leaves you to decide which one is best. That leaves the question in many people's minds about, are they all the Word of God? Have they all been faithfully translated? Hardly anybody asks, what manuscripts did they come from? Do they all say the same thing? How can I choose? How can I know? Was it KGB, the NIV, the RSV, the NKIV, the NAS, the Living, the American Standard? Which one is it? Now for myself, as I was deciding, I did six things. First, I decided to believe the plain promise of God that He would and could keep His reserved words forever. Amen. Second, I decided in favor of the majority text called the Antioch text, and I decided against the minority text called the Alexandrian text because of the consideration of the place of which the manuscript was found is subtly important, and I've tried to outline that to you already. Because places in the Bible often carry spiritual implications. Here's why I did that. Here's why I favored the Antioch text. The scholars who translated the Bible for King James wanted to be very sure they were accurate. You better believe it. You don't mess around with King James. <laughs> they went, when he told them to do something, they wanted it to be correct. They wanted it to be right. And he demanded that it be correct and, and right. <clears throat> Each scholar, they divided, there, were, there was, it, the work began in 1604, there were 50-something, 50 54 scholars when they first started out, and it eventually whittled down to 47 Greek and Hebrew scholars that translated the scriptures for the King James Bible. They divided into six separate groups, and each group was given a specific portion of scripture to translate. Then each scholar in the group made his own translation of a book and then passed it on to be reviewed by each member of his group. After each member of the group had gone over the translation, the entire group then went over the book together. The next step was sent to be reviewed by the five other groups in their circle. They would mark up all the areas that needed attention and then send it back to the original group. The first group would then form a committee and fix all the marked up differences, and then it was sent out to the printer. This means that the King James Bible would pass over 14 examinations before going to press. The King James Bible was first printed in 1611, and it took 47 scholars seven years to translate it. I decided, then number four, I have, I have decided to believe the promise of God could keep His Word. I've decided for the Antioch text, and I just outlined why. I decided to trust the King James Bible because of the way it was translated. And number four, I've decided to compare the text of the King James Version because it is a majority text to, to the other Bibles. 
And I did that because of verses like Deuteronomy 4.2, Deuteronomy 12.32, and Proverbs 36, 30 and verse 6, which command us not to add or diminish from God's Word. So other Bibles, number five, would be compared to the King James Version. And I decided to compare them for their Christology. Now I did that as I was thinking about this. My logic is and was that the true Word of God would magnify Christ and not diminish Him. Amen? Amen. As I studied this, I discovered that literally all the newer Bibles have been translated from the Alexandrian text. And as I studied this, I came to see this as a satanic attack upon God's Word. And fitting perfectly with Satan's plan of evil, Satan has attacked God's Word from the very beginning. Attacking God's Word was his first attack against Adam and Eve in the garden. God hath not said. Satan has always attacked God's Word, for it's in God's Word that the promise of eternal life is given. John 5.39, Titus 1.2, and 1 John 2.25. So I came to see this as an issue, as a sign of the latter times. 2 Thessalonians 2.3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there be a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Those words falling away in that verse means an apostasy setting in. Apostasy is corruption of Christian doctrine. The dereliction of essential principles like Christology. 1 Timothy 4.1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. 2 Timothy 4.3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. So we're going to look at some comparisons. And I've chosen the NIV because of its current and most popular, as currently the most popular Bible against the King James Bible. And I've chosen the New King James Version, as it is the version that many people who call themselves fundamentalists will pick up and look at, thinking that it's as reliable as the King James Version. It's just the New King James Version. It's been made easier to read. All the these and the thous have been taken out. Stuff like that making it easier to read, closer to modern day English. So these comparisons I'm going to make will by no means be an exhaustive comparison. It's rather a whet your appetite. It's a turn on the light. It's a become aware study. It's like Pastor Steve said, it's a danger, danger, Will Robinson. Warning, warning. <laughs> so we'll do that next week. And that's the end of that message for today. And believe me, folks, there's so much I wanted to give you, but you know, I gotta keep this, I gotta keep this short. <laughs> no, I mean if if I go over 45 minutes, you you turn the switch off. You don't hear anything else I say. I know that. I do the same thing. <laughs> but are there any questions?